The Book Slack January 2022 release is now here. Let's check out the latest new features. Now, before we jump in, there's a couple of upgrade notices to be aware of. One of those is a change to the permission system, which could change how permissions apply within the system and the access that people have. Now, really, this only should apply in really complex edge case scenarios that have only been possible since Bookstack 22.10. But if you want to find out more information, I'm going to run about permissions later on in this video, or you can find out more on our blog post page here. Another thing to be aware of is the database upgrade time during this release. So because of those permission system changes, we're having to regenerate the permission cache upon upgrade, which may mean that the PHP artisan migrate step may take a little bit of extra time when upgrading your Bookstack instance. Just warning so you don't try and cancel it or anything. It is expected, just leave it to complete. But with those out of the way, let's jump into the new features. So the first thing is a new customization setting. So we've got this new option here, application icon. And this allows you to set an icon that will be used in the sort of tab icons up here and within mobile application icons as well. So if we go ahead and select an image and customize our own icon, and I'll find a nice one. Here we go, that is good. And I'll scroll down here and hit save. You can now see up here, it has changed and that is now our little tab icon. So this is a separate setting from the application logo because it's intended to be a different aspect ratio. So the application icon is really expected to be a square image of a certain size and a certain type. And when you upload the application icon, Bookstack behind the scenes is going to resize that into quite a few different sizes to ensure sort of wide browser and mobile device compatibility. And within my blog post, I've got an example of how that might look on a mobile device. So yeah, hopefully that should be found quite useful because this is quite a difficult thing to achieve. It could be done by some kind of server hackery, but now it should be a lot easier. The next feature that I've got for you is the application color scheme. So previously in this section, we had the setting for the app primary color and then the settings for the different item level colors. Now this bit of the settings area has been redesigned and they're kind of now all in this one space. But the main thing that's also been added is now the ability to switch to between light and dark modes and set colors separately for those. Just a little bit of warning, there's going to be some flashing here as we switch between them. Because as we switch to dark mode, for example, the interface is going to change to dark mode so that you can select the colors that kind of fit the UI. Otherwise, it's quite hard to kind of select those on a light background if you're trying to choose colors that work with the dark background. So I can come in here and, for example, let's say for shelves, I want a much more vibrant type of red. There we go. And then for books, I want a uh, yeah, much more vibrant type of green as well. And I'll save those. And now if I switch to dark mode, then go to books, we can see our book color is now a much more vibrant green. If we go to shelves, that is also a much more vibrant red. So now it's possible to kind of tweak these colors and get the best contrast possible and choose colors that work best with the theme. Or you could have completely different colors between dark and light mode if you really wanted. Now, another change in this area that you might have already spotted is the default link color option. So this didn't exist previously, but this now applies to all kind of text based links or actions within the system. So, for example, these tabs or if we look at a page, these actions as well, because previously they would just use the app primary color, which will be used for things like this banner. And they're quite different use cases. So you might set a nice color for this, but then find that the contrast between the background and when that color is used for text makes it really difficult to see certain things like these actions. But now with the inclusion of this default link color setting, we can configure that separately. So if we go for like an, uh, an electric yellow, there we go. And then we'll go down here and hit save. We'll go back to that book, refresh, and we can now see these are a much higher contrast looking color. And this doesn't affect just these actions, it affects kind of all text-based links, so also links within your content as well. And of course, with the addition of the different colors for different modes, this is configurable separately. Go back to light mode, and now that color is what it exactly is. It's not electric yellow, because we configured that in dark mode. Next up are a whole host of improvements to the book sorting experience. So to quickly run through what's changed, you can now collapse books within this view, which is especially useful if you've got a lot of books going on. So if we add in ID department, we can now kind of collapse that one to then focus on our ID department book if we wanted to. These items now show a little drag handle to make it clear to users that you can drag things around. On the topic of dragging, it used to be possible to multi-select items within this interface and drag and drop multiple things in one go. Unfortunately, that got broken at some point, but that has been fixed within this update. So if we select three of these items, for example, we can just drop them all in there in one go. One thing that you might notice are these new buttons. So we have move up and move down buttons, in addition to a little menu that provides a lot of extra advanced options, such as you can 
move to previous book, move to start of book, end of book, fourth chapter, after chapter, a whole host of things that will be contextually based on what that item is and where it exists in the hierarchy currently. These actions also make it possible to use this interface when you're using mobile devices or if you've only got access to the keyboard and no mouse. I also spent some time with a screen reader making sure that everything is possible to do and is fairly sensible for users that don't have the ability to visually see this interface and have to depend on hearing alone. Additionally, we got some new intro text on each of the sections just to be able to introduce users coming to this interface about what it's for and how to use it. And looking at the sidebar, this show other books section will now stick to the interface when you're using a desktop device so that you can always easily add a new book even if you scroll down looking at some stuff down the page. And also, as I showed there, it's only one click to now add items, whereas before it was like a double click or a click and then click an add button. It's now been simplified so you can just simply click an item and it will be added into the sort interface. Next up, we have some new languages within the code editor and within code highlighting in general. So these additions include a whole bunch of SQL variants. Previously, we did have an SQL language option, but it was a generic SQL option which would trip up on some vendor-specific syntax. But now you could be a bit more focused on a lot of the popular types of SQL. And in addition to that, we've also got Smarty and Twig, which are PHP templating languages. For OpenID Connect users, we have a new ID configuration option. So this allows you to configure the ID that Bookstack uses to connect a Bookstack user to a user in their identity platform. Now, realistically, this shouldn't be needed by the vast majority of use cases because by default, the OIDC has a pretty good standard on these things. And therefore, the identity platforms would already provide a sensible value on the claim that Bookstack is using. But this setting has been added to kind of help scenarios. The defaults provided by the identity provider may not make sense. So in this case, it's particularly useful for Azure Active Directory, where the ID that it uses by default is one that's unique to the application and the user, rather than being a globally unique user identifier across multiple applications. And this may be uh, troublesome if you want that ID to be predictable and something you can set beforehand. But yeah, not needed by most, but some might find that helpful. Now, as is usual, the translations in Bookstack have received a massive amount of updates. So a big thanks to everyone listed here that has helped to translate the Bookstack interface since our last major release. And now we come to permissions. So a lot of time went in since the last release to look to add some new features to the permission system. My main goal was uh, user level permissions, much like we have for roles. But unfortunately, just due to some complexity balanced with performance considerations, that work kind of fell through, probably won't be implemented anytime too soon. But while doing that work, it did lead me to find quite a few really quite complex permission scenarios that weren't handled consistently throughout the platform. And these were mainly new scenarios that have only really been possible since Bookstack 22.10, and in particular via the everyone else permission controls, where you can now inherit permissions from both roles and other layers within the hierarchy stack of content while also applying role level permissions. And when all these things are combined up, the logic expected to then take place is somewhat open to interpretation. And even parts of Bookslack's internal permission checking systems didn't align in how it handled some of these cases. So there could be scenarios where a user might be able to see an item when it's listed out, but when they actually click it to go into it, they're not able to access that and receive permission error. So during this release cycle, I spent a lot of time defining exactly how these permission systems should interplay, exactly what results should be expected out there. And this is all defined within a permission scenario testing document within our GitHub repository, where we also have a whole bunch of test cases saying exactly what should happen when every kind of possible scenario occurs. And each one of these scenario tests is then backed up by functional testing logic that's kind of automatically run within the Bookstack code base to ensure that these expectations are still met whenever we make changes in the future. But to help portray this, I have updated the roles and permissions page within the Bookstack documentation to have an advanced permission logic section where it kind of provides a high level understanding of those rules that we implement. But to outline what that logic looks like, you can simplify the permission system to three different levels of permissions. You have the role permissions, which are configured through an interface like this when you're looking at a role. And then you have the content everyone else permissions, which are applied when you use this row here. And in particular, when you unselect inherit and then start activating these controls. And then you have the item level role permissions, which are these items here. So those role level permissions are considered the least specific with these item level role permissions considered the most specific. And then these everyone else permissions are considered kind of in between those. And Bookstack will look at 
whatever permissions apply that are most specific. So these role permissions override these everyone else permissions, and these everyone else permissions override these role permissions. So by unselecting inherit here and allowing view, I'm allowing any role to now view this item. And then the original role permissions are essentially ignored because this applies to pretty much everyone else in the system, apart from those that have role level item permissions such as these. So then these will override those permissions. And if these aren't set, these will still also override these role permissions. So yeah, it can get really confusing because there's multiple layers and multiple ways these interact. But one thing this does mean is that, for example, for these this editor here, by not having view permissions, this is then overriding pretty much everything else. So then users of the editor role will not be able to view this book and the contents within it. But that said, if a user had both the editor and viewer roles, they would be able to see it because this viewer permission is at the same level. And when we find two permissions at the same level, we'd always side towards giving permission rather than denying it. Now, when it comes to permissions on chapters and pages, where pages may inherit the chapter and book permissions, and chapters may inherit the book permissions, if those items have role level permissions applied and are inheriting, then they will inherit the role level permissions from their parents as well. And those role item level permissions will be considered to be at the same level. So it's almost like all of the role item level permissions stack down and are considered just to be on a flat single layer. Except if that sort of, for example, page or chapter had its own role permission defined for the same role, in which case the role item permission on the page or chapter will take priority over that on the book because it's again more specific for that item. So as I touched upon earlier, these changes could technically affect the visibility or access that people within your system may currently have. But realistically, it's only in these very complex edge cases. And a lot of that even then still aligns with what it was. It's just some areas have been more defined, cleaned up and aligned with how we deal with permissions in the system. So hopefully any effects that it should have to current access and visibility should be very, very minimal. So apologies that changes have been introduced, but here that it was really a required thing to probably define that logic and fix potential instability in the current system. All right, with that run over, that is everything I've got to show in this release. The next release for February is targeted to be quite boring. I'm going to dedicate it to upgrading some of the frameworks and libraries used by Bookstack to make sure that we're keeping up with the software that we're using. An important thing to note is that our minimum version of PHP will change from PHP 7.4 to PHP 8.0. But as is usual for those, we'll put out some help and guidance where possible, especially for those that have used our installation scripts in the past. And another thing that I'm going to be doing is continuing to build out a kind of hacks or customization area of the Bookstack site, where some of the common customizations using either sort of custom HTML in the head or the visual theme system or the logical theme system can be shared in kind of a central place. And on an unrelated note, there's now a Bookstack account on Macedon. So feel free to follow us there if that's where you like to get your updates. I'll put a link to the Booksack profile in the description of this video. But yeah, that's everything that I've got for this video. If you have any issues, feel free to shout out on Bookstack, GitHub, Discord, Twitter, or Mastodon. Otherwise, I hope you like the new features that are added to Bookstack, and I hope you have a wonderful day.